Good morning. My name is Kelly Ma. I am the Assistant Director of Global Arts and Collaborations at Asia Society Museum in New York. Welcome to the fourth Museum Salon, Architecture for Our Future Together. It's my pleasure to share a conversation today with four architects whose work I've admired, Jing Liu of Soil, Hani Rashid of Asimto Architecture, Shohei Shigematsu of OMA, and Kisuke Toyoda of Noise Architects. At our previous museum salon, we spoke to colleagues on three continents about the creative life during a global pandemic and varied levels of shutdown and reopening of public art institutions. It's clear that while digital programs such as this one can fill some of the void left by the cancellations of various cultural activities, the transformative in-person experiences are irreplaceable. We have been starved for the beauty of site specificity in the last five months. As some New York museums prepare to reopen this week, so have their remaining staff slowly returned from months of telecommuting. What used to be the marvel of our cultural life is still on hold indefinitely. It makes us wonder how the arts will operate in a post-COVID world. The exodus from cities across the US and the renewed embrace for the suburbs and the countryside is not unlike the protagonists in Giovanni Boccaccio's Decameron fleeing the Black Death that plagued 14th century Florence. Much of modern society's design is based on the premise of shared resources and collective future, such as education, healthcare, and transportation. The global pandemic has had an equitable impact on the most vulnerable members of our society and exposed the shortcomings of current infrastructure that have been swept under the carpet. Humankind has weathered previous catastrophes and historical crises have given rise to new thinking. Perhaps the path to responsibly come together lies in the re-evaluation of our approach to public spaces. It's hard to predict what awaits us, but hopefully from our conversation today, we can constructively imagine a future together where we can join each other and immerse in the communal experience of the arts. Before we begin, I'd like to thank our members and patrons for their continuous support. You may have noticed that our museum programs have been free and we are very grateful that we can carry on with our work through the temporary closure of our galleries. Please consider donating to Asia Society Museum at any capacity to bring more content to you. Thank you. You can learn about our spring exhibition, The Art of Impermanence, Japanese works from the John C. Weber Collection and Mr. and Mrs. John D. Rockefeller III Collection and its works on our website, as well as go on a virtual tour led by Adriana Prozer, the curator of the exhibition. All four exhibition lectures are available, are available online. Please visit asiasociety.org slash museum. In our current time of uncertainty, Asia Society Museum is moving forward with the inaugural Asia Society Triennial entitled, We Do Not Dream Alone. We have been doing a series of Instagram live dialogues and online only content with triennial artists in preparation for the exhibition opening this fall. Please visit asiasociety.org slash triennial for updates. For information about all of our work here in New York and around the globe, please visit our website and subscribe to our newsletter. Today's conversation will run 50 minutes, followed by Q&A through Facebook and YouTube. Please list your questions in the comment or live chat sections. After the broadcast, the conversation will be posted on the Asia Society website. So thank you, Hani, Jean, Kiske, and Sho for taking the time today to speak with us and share your thoughts and observations during the pandemic. I'm especially grateful that Kiske and Sho are willing to take part as it is 11 o'clock at night in Tokyo. I'd like to start with how your work has been affected by COVID-19, especially given that architecture is an incredibly international industry. The scene from Sofia Coppola's Lost in Translation, where the, life, where, the, where the wife faxes curtain samples to the Kenzo Tange Design Park Hyatt Hotel in the small hours in Tokyo probably feels even more prescient now. Perhaps we can start with Hani. 
Yeah, hi. Uh, so it's wonderful, uh, wonderful to be here on, on this panel and um, and to be speaking with all of you. Um, a group of people that I have incredible respect for um, and have followed uh, over the years. Um, how, how the work has been affected by COVID-19 is an interesting question. I think in a way it's kind of a bittersweet uh, situation. On, on the one hand, uh, you know, we've uh, found ourselves, of course, um, sort, of, sort of changing the ways we think and work and, and operate as, as architects. Um, uh, but on the other hand, I think it's been kind of a welcome situation in a very strange way in the sense that, it, that we've sort of hit the pause button um, on, 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 uh, on many things in the discipline and many things in life in general, of course. And by hitting the pause button, uh, we've sort of given ourselves the opportunity to, to rethink uh, and reassess, um, you know, all aspects of our lives, I'm sure. Everybody um, from, from our physical states to, to, uh, to our, our philosophical sort of, um, you know, uh, conditions and meanderings. Um, and in the discipline itself, uh, I think the... Um, you know, we, we were running quite a quite a heated engine, I think, in, in the discipline of architecture. There was a, you know, we, we sort of uh, started stumbling on ourselves in terms of uh, the sort of proliferation of styles, the, the sort of the lip service paid to all kinds of things from, from the environment to uh, sustainability uh, and so on to uh, sort of, you know, uh, dogmas and, 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 and sort of Know, credos taking 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 the front stage every every day by virtue of social media and so on, um, and so this 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 kind of pause has has allowed us to sort of, I think in a way I I, I go by a kind of um, three prong approach now to the work. Um, I, I sort of think of the work in terms of uh, something we didn't really think about that profoundly before, um, which is um, aspects of redundancy, uh, something engineers have always understood, but I've started thinking very seriously about how we as architects should really employ the notion of redundancy. Um, and, and that is to say that to sort of repeat things in the, in, the, in the sense that they could in fact be enacted in the event that something fails. Um, the, the second thing I think about a great deal with, with the work now is, is the notion of resilience. Um, and resilience in the sense that, um, you know, uh, what, what we basically are seeing the cities. I mean, the, the fact that you know, there's an interesting op-ed these days between uh, what Jerry Seinfeld and the mayor and, and Cuomo, uh, you know, talking about is New York over, um, you know, because of all this. And, and it's this notion of resilience, urban and urbanism, and what, what constitutes resilience that has started to really come to the front and, 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 and really be something to think about in terms of the way we work. And the last thing, quite frankly, um, that we think about a great deal in the work is the notion of rebooting entirely, starting with a fresh palette, a fresh sort of tablet or, or tabula rasa. Um, part of the reboot, and this is the last thing I'll say, I know because we have limited time and we can move on, but part of the reboot um, for me and for us has, has ironically been the, the difference in which, we, in the way we work internationally. Um, it was really interesting that prior to the pandemic, <clears throat> I was being asked, of course, like all of us, to fly all over the place, uh, be at meetings, uh, uh, be face to face with clients and, and engineers and consultants and so on all the time. Um, and it got to the point where between the permanent state of jet lag and the kind of um, uh, the, the condition of sort of the subjectivity of always being in person, in place, in front of people, depending on your mood, you know, how do you feel? How, was taking hold to the point where sometimes it got very murky as to how and where and why decisions were being made, especially with the transfer of languages across so to bring your sort of uh, Coppola movie into, into focus there. Uh, and, and so what, what I've discovered, and this is gonna sound really strange, but the use of Zoom and teleconferencing <clears throat> to, with very complex clients in various parts of the world and consultants has actually had a kind of silver lining um, we meet more often. Uh, there is a, there's a need to focus. Uh, one doesn't get distracted. Uh, one is able to sort of concentrate uh, and, and, and spend the time that we otherwise would lose by virtue of traveling and dinners and socializing in that respect um, to, to actually concentrating on, on creativity and, and, and ideation and work. So I think that in a strange way, the, um, the ability to uh, focus and work and meet when necessary 
on very focused and necessary things. It's, it's helping in a way, at least in our case, as a practice, uh, the way we, we proceed. So those are the effects so far that we've been feeling from, from this COVID situation, um, which of course has many, many downsides, but I'm, I'm a, I think I'm genetically predisposed to being an optimist. So uh, that's, that's kind of where we stand. Great, thank you, Hanny. Um, I remember first meeting Hani at his office and learning about his culture plan for Baku, Azerbaijan. The project has an emphasis on linking cultural spaces through promenades and maximizing the city's pedestrian potentials on the coast of the Caspian Sea. Um, we'll come back to urbanism a little later. Um, Jane, would you like to elaborate from your perspective? Yeah, and I think uh, um, many things that uh, Hani touched on is exactly the same um, or similar experience that we all have um, been having in the last couple of months. Um, I have not uh, traveled outside of this adopted country since um, I think in November or December last year, which is a very um, strange experience for me um, to be experience all this social uprise and you know um, complexities of discourse. Um, Discuss discursive discussions all in one context is, is something that's very um, a new experience for me. And um, just before we jumped onto this call, I think the Fed was uh, um, talking about its economical recovery plan. And it also made me to really wonder, um, I think what the pandemic really exposed it, it to us maybe it's not new, but we're experiencing in it in a visceral way is the complexity of all the issues that um, we knew was problematic, but didn't know how to deal with, especially in the architectural discipline. Um, I think the lip service of sustainability of environmental crisis is one good example that today we have to deal with the both unemployment and, um, you know, the, the welfare and the um, you know, employment and uh, economics of um, architecture practice. And at the same time, I, I'm sure everyone on this, um, you know, on this um, panel has been feeling guilty about certain aspect of the work that we've been doing, flying all over the world, um, having so much carbon footprint in what we do, the practice itself. So I think we have been struggling with the, the idea of permanence versus impermanence from the beginning of our practice. Um, some of the slides I put together um, for today um, showed a range of projects that are ranging from incredibly impermanent projects and just to, to be as low footprint, carbon footprint as possible with the project and having the maximum cultural effect. And some of the project are dealing with uh, hundreds of years of history and inevitably we have to use very carbon intensive, energy intensive method like a concrete to, to make those projects and then still thinking about what would be the afterlife of all these uh, um, materials and urban forms and architectural forms after, you know, half, half a decade or a decade. And I think, you know, what pandemic really made us as a group of uh, practitioner to really take a deeper look at our, um, you know, our, our everyday life and our everyday practice and think about how do we deal with our old um, presence. I think the discipline is still very much um, addicted to the image of newness and addicted to the form of, um, the, to a certain extent, uh, you know, tabula rasa. I don't believe personally tabula rasa. I think we have to um, be able to deal with our old um, self in order to move on. So um, some of this uh, projects that we, I feel very dear to um, this days is exactly to deal with the old context. Great, thank you, Jean. Um, it is true that we've all, we've taken a lot for granted and in including what we glean from in-person interactions. Um, and the intellectual sparks are just difficult to replicate when we're um, not seeing each other in person. Um, when we communicate via a device, things become static, not as spontaneous, which is where a lot of creativity lies in and we become more easily distracted. Um, this is the same with live performances. Each show it's different because the energy from the audience is different. Um, and when you have a dedicated space for a specific purpose, whether it's music, dance, theater, exhibition, or as basic as dining and sleeping, it helps create mental boundaries for us to be more focused and efficient. And this is a benefit 
of modern architecture and urban planning. If you have visited historical houses such as um, the Qing Dynasty Merchant's House in Yutang at the Peabody Essex Museum, or the ones at the Brooklyn Museum and the Tenement Museum on the Lower East Side, or seeing the period films by Shohei Imamura and Akira Kurosawa, like Ballad of Narayama and Seven Samurai, you would remember that pre-modern houses often have all the functions of a home crammed into one or a few rooms. We can come back to the promises of modernism in a bit, um, which the Washington Post, Philip Kennecott touched on in his essay, Designing to Survive, last month. Keske, can you share with us how it's been in Tokyo? Hi, yep. Uh, in Tokyo, um, it's been strangely calm in a way that, of course, it is not normal, definitely. And then we were planning to have an Olympic and a Paralympic right now, and it's apparently postponed. So it's been affected, uh, affecting quite a bit, especially for those kind of cultural activities like events and then exhibitions. And particularly for architects, it is affecting quite a bit that the, uh, many of the, most of the shows are either canceled and exp ex you know, postponed to the uh, next year or end of the year. So um, it is difficult in terms of maintaining the uh, kind of cultural life exchange and an experience quality and diversity of the uh, channels of the uh, sense in the reality of the art, et cetera, et cetera. For instance, our case, we are, apparently we had the uh, Olympic and you know, we were expecting a, a bunch of international tourists and visitors. Uh, we, we had about like 10 cases of an exhibition and special events this summer, all of them are gone. So project-wise it's difficult and some of the, the ones are coming back in a way. For instance, this one is the, uh, the, the co-exhibition with the Asao Tokoro, who is the designer of the uh, Olympic logo. Uh, we were planning to have the uh, in-gallery show as an ex interactive exhibition, but the, uh, the venue is canceled. So now we have to shift completely to the online exhibition. We want to maintain the uh, same theme, but it uh, got to be you know, via online email, I mean, uh, the website. So it's quite a little different and channels and experience quality is totally different. And that's been happening for many, you know, uh, territories like teaching. Apparently the all the schools, uh, university classes are all, you know, online. Maybe, maybe the, uh, some lectures are fine, but the, especially for architecture school type of like a hand making kind of thing, it's affecting a lot too. So I, you know, I don't know. I don't know how the students are surviving, but they, they might be, ex, you know, uh, raising a different channels of the uh, sense and creativity. So I'm kind of interested in how they can evolve into the uh, professions in a few, in a ten years later. Um, in terms of the uh, the daily life, uh, apparently the the uh, the works are done from home, and then we have to share that kind of daily life, family life with the work and professional kind of creative activities that's been affecting quite a bit, especially for the, uh, how the uh, transforming the uh, daily, like a living room into the office or vice versa is quite difficult, especially for Japanese society, I guess, that their work and then private life is completely separate thing used to be, but now it, it is forced to be mixed. Uh, in the sense that there's one interesting case that. Uh, there is the building that designed by Kikutake, the one of the masterpiece of the postmodernism, and the uh, and that was completely gone. That it's demolished last year, but the uh, we happened to have the occasion opportunity to 3D scan completely precisely and visualize it in a 3D model. And now we have this model, and now it's kind of spreading around for the potential venue for the uh, meetings and events and stuff. So now the actual building is gone physically, but the, it has that having the uh, second life on the uh, virtual status and then having a completely different, you know, people kind of gathering around and different type of value. Um, so it is, there is the, some kind of aspect that the uh, uh, triggering some different kind of experiences and channels. Great. Thank you, Kiske. Um, also seeing that Kikutake model is really great. I mean, I, 
I will, I will talk a little bit more around that in a little bit. Um, Sho, how do things look in your last few months in Tokyo? It feels very strange I'm not running into you at like lectures or exhibitions and stuff. Hi. Well, that sounds like I'm a very outgoing person, but <laughs> I'm not. Um, well, it was, of course, a very strange moment uh, that I have been here in Tokyo. Um, but of course, there were some positive um, realizations, let's say. Um, I think there are more kind of independent initiatives that are happening, at least observing Tokyo and probably partially in the States, um, that is not relying on the kind of ultimate power, or ultimate authority, but to really come up with your own idea and your own um, initiative to do, start doing things. And I think that's one thing that is hopeful for me, at least looking at in Japan, how like not just uh, Tokyo or big cities, but the smaller cities or smaller rural areas are trying to come up with their own way to survive. And I think that's uh, maybe much needed in, in interaction or a balance towards uh, kind of uh, city versus non-cities. I have been interested in post-crisis moment because I was doomed, I'm doomed to live with, you know, a crisis, like the economical crisis and uh, natural disaster. So I even did a studio at GSD and also GSAP uh, investigating the kind of post-crisis architecture and urbanism. And I did also uh, Olympic planning, uh, which I, I want to show you later. But um, in short, uh, after crisis, of course, people's awareness goes up, uh, although the stock market goes down. But here in this case, it's a rare, of course, the first time that I experienced that the stock market is going up. And people's awareness is going up, but uh, I don't know, it's almost like a kind of um, steroid kind of injected um, a boosted economy. I don't know how real that is. But anyway, I think there is some kind of uh, new condition that we have to all tackle together. Um, but one thing I noticed in the city, which I can only mention as a kind of concern, but I have been always thinking that architecture has been more and more precise. Each program has to be like this and like that, uh, kind of being delivered and you know solidified between client and architects and society. But now I, I have a feeling that even the cities are becoming like that through this uh, moment because you need to book a time to go to the museum. You need to have social distance. You need to have a uh, certain regulated time to go around the cities. And I think it's just cities uh, using AI and also big data. It's, I, I have a feeling that it's more and more controlled, sometimes in a good way, but also in a kind of excessive way. And because I didn't have much to do during the pandemic in the beginning, I walked so much uh, in, in Tokyo. And I think that was uh, not even meeting anyone, but just, just wondering. And it was such a kind of uh, fun moment for me. And, you know, I think I could do that even longer uh, if I wanted to. And I think that really made me feel that uh, this kind of moment was probably necessarily, at, at, at least for uh, me, who was, as Hani said, just brainlessly kind of flying and um, uh, also, as Jean said, basically kind of not completely addressing the issue of environment. So I'm just kind of rambling about my experience, but uh, uh, I think that we there are some hopes and um, of course some um, negatives that I'm worried about. But in the end, I think after crisis, any crisis, um, there will be some level of progress. And uh, let's say I'm committed to capture that uh, progression. Great. Thank you, Sho. Um, I really like the part about walking and wandering around because I think that makes that makes me think of, you know, the 19th century Paris tradition of a flaneur, like the middle class, you know, walking around the city and exploring, you know, life um, mm -hmm. in the city. 
And that's something that we all really miss right now. Um, so I'm curious to hear whether some reflection um, towards current designs of public spaces have emerged while we are grounded from flying. I mean, we're seeing a few examples from everybody. Um, so is it possible to incorporate intervention so that we can avoid the dangers of either the current pandemic or future disasters? I'm reminded that 30 years ago in 1990, the US signed the Americans with Disabilities Act and the quality of so many people's lives have benefited. Of course, the work is never done and there is still lots of space for improvement as Michael Kimmelman pointed out um, in his article last month for the New York Times. While being a woman is in no way a kind of disability, Usually when you go see a performance or a movie and use the lavatory before the show, it's always the ladies room that have a meandering line and no line in front of the men's. I've also learned through the pregnancies and early motherhood of my friends and colleagues, the very inconsiderate designs of our society in general for people who are pregnant and nursing. And not to mention, if you're left-handed, your life is doomed. Can architecture and design be part of the current social movement and help promote better equality? Um, Jane, would you, would you like to start? Yeah, I would like to share maybe, um, as the show was saying, that there's just a lot of um, independent um, initiative that's at this moment um, kind of bottom up, um, stirred up, um, and maybe share is the story of the project that we're doing through this pandemic in the last two, three months. So we've been um, part of this group of architects and um, designers who are um, literally just self-organized and wending to neighborhoods that's being hard, uh, hit hardest in around the city, in the boroughs. Um, so these are Jackson Heights, Corona, um, Queens, Bed-Stuy in uh, Brooklyn, um, King's Bridge in um, Bronx. I mean, we've seen the statistics that um, pandemic has hit both economically and uh, health-wise um, unequitably um, in the more economically distressed and the immigrant often and the colored um, communities. And so our site was um, Jackson Heights. And what's really interesting is that um, while we're working in a public space, like turning the streets into uh, places people, shop owners and restaurants can go out and have um, um, have their economical activity to continue. Um, I don't know how much that would help that community because uh, they are already, they have lost so many people um, due to the pandemic and then so many businesses already have closed. Um, but whatever we can do to, to help them um, has or, already been met with so many resistance and the complexity in the urban planning. For example, we were trying to get the uh, restaurants to, to go out to the streets and they realized that many of the restaurants have the, uh, the licenses that's doubling as groceries. So they cannot be part of that restaurant um, initiative that they, the restaurant industry lobbied with the city. And also the first um, car accident that hit the outdoor restaurant happened like two blocks from our um, neighborhood. Um, so you really realize that, that the lack of really good intelligent planning separating the uh, the car vehicular public transportation and pedestrian um, traffic in certain areas just has never been dealt with. And um, you also realize that many of these applications, they're in English, they're online, and a lot of people just don't have access to that. Um, and you also realize that, um, um, uh, what was I gonna say? Um, you, yeah, I, I think you also realize that the police um, what well, the precincts there are completely um, suspicious of the people's, the residents and the community's ability to um, monitor themselves. They were suspicious that they can even maintain the um, outdoor um, seatings and outdoor um, restaurants. Um, so the, the, the distrust and the level of um, just the complexities uh, in this neighborhood um, that um, is at a disadvantage in this pandemic and in the crisis are all exposed by our work um, on the ground and you realize that um, this complexity is not going to be solved in one day or well, one blueprint it really would take many many uh, years of a committed um, you know work on the ground um, to 
um, to make the crisis um, in towards a better direction, I would say more productive direction. Great, thank you. Um, let us, um, let's come, go back to show. Um, what's your reflection on that? Um, sorry. Um, um, I don't have strong uh, case like Jean has. Um, I don't know, this is a diagram that I have been using for because, you know, I was in the, you know, we were discussing how the museum would change, for example, in this kind yeah. of moment. Um, this is a very simplified <laughs> diagram I made, how the gallery space, in, in a way, architecture's growth of the space is very limiting, but the amount of community engagement, amount of thinking, amount of activities are increasing and amount of collections and diversity of art is rapidly increasing in the society. So you can already see the discrepancy between architecture, which is in yellow, uh, and the line of blue and red. And that's how we were reading the museum has to evolve or how we have to provide uh, a space of yellow while incorporating the uh, blue and red. And these are some examples we did how to incorporate those kind of diverse activities, which of course, right now it's, as you can see, this almost looks like a crime if you see it now uh, with so many people in one space, but I think it's still, I still believe that even post Corona, this kind of initiative and creating an extreme accessibility to a diverse um, group of people and a diverse group of uh, artists, et cetera, it's, it's very uh, important. Um, also how to do that is not to allocate such a space as a program space, but as I said uh, earlier, how city is now completely controlled and regulated um, I have the feeling that you should provide a space that is not programmed or regulated or kind of allocated. So it's architect's job, I think, to basically deliver what was asked, which is in all black here. But we basically just made a roof that uh, kind of connects those, uh, what was given and provided this extra space uh, to, for them to program or for the community to use. Uh, so, again, this is a little bit of a post a pre pandemic uh, thinking and I'm a bit um, perplexed by how to say how uh, we can embrace it other than to really kind of incorporate um, the um, public engagement piece even more stronger in the beginning. But I also don't like when, you know, people start to I think this also applies to uh, environmental issues, but as if you know, there are some people who says architects to the architects as if we haven't addressed the sustainability at all before, you know. But the architecture was all about sustainability uh, uh, before, like you know, MEP uh, world actually started to uh, be so powerful. So. Uh, I think we have been trying to engage more. We have been trying to open architecture. We have been trying to make institutions look more transparent. But I think, I guess we just have to be, as Jean was doing, a little bit more bottom up and being more and more involved into the um, uh, those initiative. And uh, we should also initiate those things strongly, especially in the States. But I think it, it's, of course, relevant to uh, to the entire world. Sure. And no, I, I think that definitely resonates with um, all of us. And when I was um, taking architecture classes, um, our professor definitely talked about arcology, which is a concept that was developed in the 1970s. So 
for architecture to be addressing like environmental issues is definitely it's definitely not new. Um, so Keske, um, when we spoke previously, we also you know had a brief discussion on the Ginza Arakawa idea of reversible destiny, and so I, I was also thinking like tagging on the two questions like whether um, there's any thoughts that's related to that. Yes. Um, yep. Um, yeah, Ginza and Alakawa, they are known that they have built the uh, actual architecture complex in Japan, the one in Tokyo and the one in the, uh, near Nagoya, which is kind of like a huge park, a surreal park, which physicalized into, and there are quite a few of my friends broke their bone and then they get injured. <laughs> so um, it is quite dangerous, but it's, it is very inspiring and an amazing park. But um, that apparently uh, kind of raised the question of uh, universality or the physical kind of ability type of issues. And that maybe that might be already superficial. It ha might extend out to much extended concept of universality. Um, that lead me to the uh, idea that I just happened to uh, be uh, directing the, the venue design for Expo 2025 in Osaka, which Japan has won. And we have been talking a question about like, what's the meaning of the having Expo in this era? Um, that was before the Corona happened. So it's kind of like more purely for the future projection or what the, the architecture and an Expo venue as the uh, kind of architecture construction can project into the value of the new future society. And somehow through the ex, uh, experience of the bidding process, I learned that the BIE, which is equivalent to the IOC of the Olympic, the, the VIE, BIE somehow has the high respect and expectation for Japan that the, we have the good kind of understanding for the universality for the disability, like a slope for the wheelchair and stuff which I never really thought about, but the, we have kind of trying to make the expo venue into the uh, next level. We've been kind of emphasized that the venue could enhance the universality in a different level. Apparently, physicality is the uh, fundamental thing that the, and then physicality could be different ways that the, uh, you know, the ear, hearing, listening, and the uh, wheelchair or the cane, whatever. But that could be extended to the uh, like cultural not disability, but the difference, but the technology in, embedded into the, the environment of the city could enhance the communication in terms of the AR kind of VR thing or translation or the, uh, the you know, any many devices can assist the, the uh, navigation and communication. And also, um, you know, the, uh, the food and stuff, haral food and stuff, that all, all those things could be enhanced by the technology we can embed into the environment of the city and building. And that has been the kind of uh, awareness that I've yeah, learned through the, uh, the Expo Venue Design. Um, that has been quite highly um, evaluated through the process. And I think uh, that was the one of the strength point that we, we've won the case. But now it's moving into the new, uh, new stage of the exhibition. But they are also, that made me realize that the, how difficult to show and visualize the future city as the visual or the solid model. This is one of the exhibition we've done uh, half a year ago. And then in the Mori Museum, but it's all canceled in the middle of the, uh, the exhibition due to, due to the COVID-19 case. And that's a pity, but the, uh, the, the main thing of this exhibition is it's difficult to show the, uh, the true value of the future city or the environment that the, we can design as an architect as the physical kind of composition because the value lies in the higher dimension of the information in a way. Let's say Uber changed the nature of the taxi quite drastically, you know, that you can define, you can be the taxi or you stop being a taxi any moment. And that's the fundamental change of the nature of a taxi in history. But the, uniquely, Uber wouldn't require a car to be a different design. 
the design could be the same. So physicality doesn't need to be changed due to the, uh, you know, the going to the next step. So that's the kind of difficult or interesting question in a way to the architect the where and how we can show our value to communicate and then you know contribute to society that that might be stepping into the new stage that's what i feel great thank you keske um Hany, would you like to respond Hany, i think you're muted <laughs> The proverbial, I muted. You know, if only in real, if only in real life we had that, right? For people. Um, no, I, I think that uh, I, he's uh, absolutely on on the on the mark, uh, Kieske. I think that that's exactly um, the the issue at hand and 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 where we stand as architects moving um, moving forward. Um, you know, I think I, I think one thing, and I, I don't want to sound like a kind of an alarmist uh, and so on, but. The interesting thing that's come about through this whole uh, crisis, let's say, um, has been an, an unbelievable uh, re revealing of the downside of efficiency um, and the kind of um, the kind of you know the, the mandates to that, that modernist architecture perhaps overlaid on us, and we're still kind of working with it, uh, of, of, of really targeting the most efficient solution, the most efficient urban uh, sort of environments, the most efficient, uh, to Jing's point, the most efficient way of controlling a neighborhood, uh, the most efficient way of, of, of policing, the most efficient, you know, it, it runs the gamut. And I think that, you know, this thing's going to pass. Um, that scary image <laughs> that... Uh, that Shoy showed of the crowd of people at the opening um, is probably going to come back. Uh, you know, we're going to find ourselves, you know, with the vaccine and we'll go back to normal uh, life. But I think we need to em sort of embrace um, and, and hold on to some of the things that we've discovered through this, this pandemic that, that need to be somehow um, uh, remembered and, and brought into, uh, into our discourse. Um, and one of those is, in fact, the uh, defiance of efficiency. Um, you know, it, it amazes me that, uh, you know, I teach in Vienna and I live in New York. And I'm always, I've always been, as, as many of us, amazed by the street culture in Vienna and Europe, uh, the notion of street cafes and, and just urban space going back to the late 18th and 19th century that's still kind of, you know, uh, re has resisted in a way uh, the modernist, uh, let's say, path to uh, efficient traffic patterns and, and so on. And all of a sudden, here we are in New York, I ride my bike to, to, to my office here in, in, in uh, Long Island City, and I pass, you know, uh, street cafes, countless outdoor eating venues, um, you know, surrounded by plants and, and looks a little bit like Vienna or Munich. Um, and, you know, it's like, this is new. <laughs> this is something all of a sudden that, that urbanists are now saying, gee, you know, we have excess space, we don't have to give it to parking, we could have less cars in the city, we could have more bikes, uh, and we could use the outdoor space for things in, in decent weather uh, for, for dining and gathering. I mean, this is what the, now, you know, what's going to happen? We get the vaccine, we go back to normal, the street cafes close down, we're back to double side street parking and efficiencies again, and getting doored by a bike <laughs> as you drive through the city and so on. So I think that's just, that's a small, it's almost trite example, but it's it really speaks volumes to uh, to, to the sort of um, things that we have started seeing through this. Uh, another thing that I just want to point out is is a kind of an interesting social civility that's that's come into play. Yes, we social distance. Yes, we you know wear masks and and we are we are sort of. Um, overly attentive to the other, let's say. But there's also a kind of a respect for the other. The wearing the mask is in fact showing respect. The standing your distance is to not harass somebody. Um, you know, um, when I run in Brooklyn, in, in the Brooklyn Park, uh, people keep their distance now out of a kind of a, it's almost kind of like a 19th century promenade. Uh, it's, it's become this kind of civil event and, and it's this dignity to, to, to existing uh, as, as, a, as a person in city space. Now, you know, will that all change? Uh, will we go back to sort of uh, overcrowding, uh, stepping on each other's space, uh, being sort of invasive and so on? It's a good question. The third thing is, and this is an example for urbanism as far as I'm concerned, is our airports um, and the living hell of, 
of taking a flight, no matter what class you fly in, uh, of moving through security and through uh, you know, various uh, kind of checkpoints and eventually crowding onto gangways and eventually crowded into airplanes with, with limited atmosphere and limited sort of civility, let's say. Um, there's, you know, the airline industry is pretty strong and they're doing a lot to offset any kind of fear we have of flying these days. Uh, and making it sound like it's going to be a civil experience again. But quite frankly, it changes the nature of public space and the way we, way we gather, the way we, we, we move through space, the way we move around the world, also when it comes to fossil fuel and so on. So I think these are things that, you know, it's going to be interesting to watch how much and where architects play, what role we play in this, um, which we need to reestablish. I mean, you, met, you mentioned Arcasanti, you mentioned Palo Solari, you mentioned, uh, I think in your text I saw also, uh, many of the 60s and 70s radical movements, UFO, uh, you know, Haus Rucker, uh, Himmelblau in that period, uh, many, many interesting, you know, sort of environmentally attuned radical movements that we somehow kind of, and metabolists, of course, one of the biggest ones. And, you know, it'll be interesting to see if we can develop, whether it's from the ground, whether it's bottom up or top down, and I don't really care where it comes from, whether we develop discourses that um, maintain some of the um, some of the uh, sort of discoveries, let's say rediscoveries that we're making through this period, and I think we have to. And architects, you know, <laughs> like it or not, I and very much what, I like what I'm hearing across the board here from everybody is we need to take control again of a kind of expertise and we need to ask ourselves what is our expertise because you know i mean what i talked about earlier about the overheating of the engine um was sort of the feeling one had in an office i don't know how you feel about this show in your office because you're quite a large office also is that you know consultants running the show right mep uh, lighting uh, engineer structural uh, and the architect sits there kind of going well you know i have a diagram <laughs> you know i can i can maybe you know have a, have a, I have a discourse, and 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 I think that that the experts coming into you know sort of running the show around the discourse of architecture, leaving the architect by the wayside, because really the confusion is what is the architect's expertise? What do they bring to the table? And we've we've sort of chased our tails on this for for a number of years, um, and I think that this is an opportunity to to sort of say, look, we do have an incredibly important expertise. We have a value and without necessarily going back and becoming utopian sort of gurus and, you know, sort of like, uh, like, like sort of, you know, running, running the kind of uh, waving our, our, our canes and wearing our round glasses. Um, but we do have um, the opportunity to sit in a room again, I think I'm beginning to see that with the projects we're working on and be turned to as experts on something that nobody else is an expert on, which is really socialization culture, um, you know, and how, how we, from a human point of view, from a hum humanistic point of view, uh, produce better cities and, 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 better, and better places to live and better places to, well, to Arakawa's point, uh, to die also, um, to Ginza and Arakawa. But, you know, I, I think it's really uh, key. And, and, I, and I just, it's a plea I'm making to, to my students and to other architects, to, to the community at large, is that, you know, we need to really get aggressive on this point of, of establishing uh, the expertise of what the architect brings to the table. And what Jing said about being in these communities is fantastic and, and really, I think, also uh, part of that equation. Um, but it has to come from both sides. Uh, the problem these days is the pendulum swung radically away from the star architects, away from top down. Um, but, you know, that, that, that needs to also be questioned and, 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 and reestablished correctly uh, to influence uh, projects from that side. Great. Thank right. you, Hanny. Right. No, no, no. This, this is great. I, I love all of the points that you have brought up and also responded to everybody's um, answers. So um, now let's talk about urban planning um, that everybody has already touched on a little bit. It seems that urban life has been reduced to a mere shadow of what it used to be. Like Jing said, restaurants and retail are operating on the curb side. Even museums in New York City are only allowed to be at a quarter of its capacity. OMA had an exhibition at the Guggenheim Museum in New York titled Countryside the Future that sees the countryside as an incubator and laboratory for humanity. I unfortunately was not able to see that show before it closed due to COVID and I hope to learn more once the Guggenheim opens in October. I don't believe city life is dead, like Kenny and everybody. 
Um, but and, and I'm very hopeful that we will be able to have much of what we relished back. But we do need to evolve our studies to make it more livable and accessible to everybody. Um, while planning this program, I think a lot about the post-war architectural movements, which Hanny mentioned, that because uh, everybody has seen my notes. Um, you know, like such as the metabolism in Japan led by Kenzo Tange, which was the focus of Fumio Nanjo's 2011 Mori Art Museum exhibition and Archigram in England, whose archive is now at the Getty Research Institute. A lot of their innovations, such as prefabrication, modular design, and mobile self-sufficient cities were not necessarily put into practice, but many of these ideas live on in contemporary urban planning. Um, so while Henny was mentioning all those great movements, I also thought about Jane Jacobs um, about you know how we we really need to rethink how urban dwelling is. Um, so imagine Bruce Willis's apartment in the Fifth Element, but less dystopian. And of course, Frank Lloyd Wright's and his house in Los Angeles, built in 1924, experimented with prefabrication and was where Harrison Ford's character lived in Blade Runner. So you see like all the great architects, you know, plans showing up in sci-fi movies. I also think about Ian Pei's visionary design for the glass pyramid entrances to the Louvre, at the time highly criticized, but it definitely solved the inadequacies of the old ones and with anticipation for an influx of visitors in the future. So Kiska, back to you. Um, what are your thoughts? Well, um... Um, now I'm talking from Tokyo that I'd like to go back to the topic of Olympic because, you know, kind of we missed the, uh, the opportunity to hold it this year and it is officially postponed for 2021. I, I mean, nothing official, but yeah, I personally believe it might be very difficult to hold it next year as usual. And uh, of course, of course, that the uh, the economical impact. But yeah, I think it might be an opportunity to change the uh, kind of nature of the experiencing sport and then joining and sharing a sports experience and stuff too. So in a way, we might need to move forward to ex how to experience and how to compete and how to kind of define the physicality of the the uh, kind of you know the movements and sports and then viewing, watching, and everything. And the digitalization of a society could be a kind of a key. And then a, the industry in Japan currently being damaged is, I feel that it, they're expecting something new might be happening uh, very soon. That the, we recently asked to design the uh, visualize the uh, new spaceport, which is expecting to be happening in five years, not even 10 years. Uh, they, they are trying to cultivate the, uh, some related industry into the uh, you know the visualization of building but which might be contracting contradicting to what i said earlier or recently we being asked to kind of visualize the uh, concept of the next generation of smart city i hate the uh, term of the smart city because it's very misleading but the uh, the industry is expecting how to merge the uh, the digitalization the uh, virtual aspect and the physicality and apparently COVID is kicking that change more drastically. Uh, the, the, make it short that the, I feel that the dispersion, fluidity and the uh, multi-layered kind of uh, nature being inter introduced into the, uh, our, the structure of the life city and building and society might need to be the key. And we don't know how to realize that, that it might be a good challenge. Uh, it might be a good kind of chance opportunity for us to come up with the new methodology and then aesthetic eventually. Great. Thank you, Kiske. Um, and Sho, do you have anything to add? Yeah, it's another difficult uh, one. Um, sorry, I'm improvising it after hearing everyone. Uh, this is, I've been doing a studio uh, at GST called Elementary Design, which was focusing on uh, food production uh, and the relationship to that, to of that to the city and architecture. This is Broadacre City, uh, done by Frank Lloyd Wright. Um, as you can see, this was a sketch he made, but it's pretty, in a way, kind of getting to a point where it's maybe being accurate, like drone is flying, 
some high-rise pastoral food production and also a low density um, city, which this was the model he presented. Of course, at that moment, the model was not that good looking, but in a way kind of capturing the kind of density of green and the agricultural land and architecture. I'm not necessarily agreeing it to it, uh, but one of the reasons that I investigated food as a key to uh, see the future of the city is to, when I saw this image, for example, that's happening in part of China, in eastern China, where the, the city and agricultural land is almost kind of merging unplanned. Um, and I think this is, I'm not saying this is the best urban design or direction we're going, but uh, one thing I can say is that uh, by looking at, for example, food, which is a fundamental part of our life, of course, and uh, food production uh, used to be very close to the city, uh, where now it's pushed out. And now there's a need of, of course, food uh, for the growth of population. And now it's even endangered by the uh, global warming. I think that the uh, not by like this is not a visual uh, cue to that uh, future, but for me, there's something about looking at each industry again, uh, like food or I don't know, fashion or retail or whatever, um, really thoroughly and uh, re uh, using uh, Hani's word, rebooting um, uh, kind of uh, those kind of core. Uh, industries and values and how that was kind of uh, that those are related to the cities uh, in general and I think uh, I looked at food but I hope that, uh, that the investigation continues in different different direction to really rethink uh, the future of the city which is not I hope the New York or Paris or London it's uh, something that our generation can um, basically embrace. Great, thank you. Um, and Jane? Yeah, I, um, yeah, I mean, I love cities. Um, I was born and raised and always lived in cities and throughout many different crises in a different cultural context. Um, and I also think that um, given the trend, current trend, um, that's going to continue, that there will be more and more migration from whatever remains as the countryside to the city and um, uh, just all, also environmental um, induced um, migration, human migration. So the city is going to be where most of the people will be living in the century, um, no matter we like it or not. And that's why I think both environmentally and socially city is where the solution is. Um, in Jackson Heights, for example, we are, you know, working on the kind of intervention on the ground uh, physically, but also what I'm, the other component of the project that I'm really interested in is to also creating a mirror virtual streets um, because many of the activities don't have to happen um, in the physical space. And the, indeed that I'm, I think the city should become smarter and it has all the technology and um, uh, the tools to become smarter. Obviously, there are control issues, there are privacy issues, there are, um, you know, equity, economical equity issues in, in who owns those data and who, who um, um, benefits from those data. And all of that has to be worked out. But I think we have to understand our um, we, we have to understand our energy consumption, our flows, and um, our economical um, distribution and accessibility much better. And we also have to understand, I think, um, as Hani was saying, that um, not everything can be quantifiable. Um, there are a lot of things that's um, civility, that's about kind of quality of human interactions. Um, I think one of the um, other, uh, I would say, um, difficulty of modernism that has imposed to us um, so far is one is efficiency and the other one is universality. And it this kind of relentless 
um, drive to try to make problems, local problems, very universal and try to kind of understand everything through only data is problematic. And so I think, you know, we at the, at the same time that we have to map and understand ourselves through the new tools and intelligence um, to make our city and our buildings smarter and our practice smarter, we have to also cultivate this other more other intelligence, which you know, only through human interactions we can understand. And hopefully that's what architects are good at. And as many of the precedents that we touched on today, that I think architecture discipline has been doing that for a very long time. And we should um, um, remind ourselves that we're, that's our expertise and our purviews at the table. Great, thank you, Jean and Henny. I unmuted. <laughs> Um, no, uh, absolutely. And I think, you know, it's really interesting if you just think for one second that what was really interesting is there was a story that was in the news just prior to COVID that I think we might have all forgotten um, and, and kind of put aside, which was that uh, City Labs, uh, the City Labs Smart City Project in Toronto uh, was shut down um, just like just before this happened. And I remember when I when I read that it was shutting down, I kind of had to smile a little bit because you know, uh, Lizanne Couture, my partner, um, who, who taught at Columbia, was teaching at Columbia for, for many years, um, had two very good students, uh, architecture students, who had worked on City Lab um, under Dr. Rob and, and in the City Lab group. And one day she, she found out that they were fired. Um, and she said, you know, well, how many architects are actually in the 2,000 plus staff at City Lab, um, at, at the uh, Sidewalk Lab? Um, and zero, zero. They were the last two architects let go. And, and I have to say, you know, it, the short-sightedness of the technology companies um, and, and especially the, these mammoth giants like Google uh, going in and thinking that they can um, come up with the efficient again, and again, universe, universality, absolutely another driver um, and, and, and produce these kind of um, quantifiable cities really at the end of the day to benefit commerce and the belief that commerce will somehow make everyone's life just better um, is, is really, is, was really an interesting poster child, I think, for part of what I talk about as being the overheated moment um, prior to COVID. You know, um, my son uh, works here in New York uh, at, at, at a company, a big company, and they have a tall building in Manhattan where he was going to work. Um, and he's been told, like many other big tech companies, um, they don't have to come to work anymore. They can work from home. Uh, and this might go on uh, in his company. It might go on for another year, maybe two. They don't even know, right? Um, and so one has to ask oneself, what happens to these structures? What happens to all of these if, if in fact, we don't sort of find a way to, 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 re, to, to re inhabit these buildings. Um, and of course, the biggest problem in these, in these tall buildings and in these urban structures is the fact that uh, close proximity of people working together, the fact that they have to pile into elevators, uh, the fact that, uh, you know, that the, that the air circulation systems, now there's a lot of talk about sick buildings coming out of this with Legionnaire's disease. Uh, because the air conditioning systems haven't worked in, in over a year or six months now. Um, so there's a, there's a lot of interesting questions to ask about the, re, um, the reestablishment of, of, of urbanism, especially when it comes to cities like New York, I'm sure Tokyo will, will have similar problems and, and many, all large metropoli. Um, so it's an interesting question, you know, do we, do, we, do we remake these places? Do we rethink these places? Are architects going to be called upon to reconsider uh, what happens with a tall structure when it, you know, could, it, could we find new ways of producing uh, work live situations and the integration of nature into these structures and so on and so forth. So there's lots of work for architects uh, in, in, this, in this problem of, of retooling and rebooting uh, that I think could be really fascinating. Um, which again, as I said in the previous comment, could all go south and we could be very much back to business as usual. Um, and and it's, an interesting, it's an interesting moment for us to kind of uh, sort of, let's say, conjure up thinking about this to, to put forward ideas. And, and, and one of the things that I'm the most sort of, let's say, not most, a little disappointed by in, 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 the, uh, in the architectural circles and discourses is that we're spending a lot of time navel gazing um, you know, if you, if you just look at the most popular strikes on Instagram uh, or 
in terms of, of what, what people are, are, are thumbing up like crazy. Uh, it's pretty, you know, insignificant stuff in the big picture. It's people are, are liking very much going towards a kind of, um, a kind of, a, a, let's say a kind of smaller problem solving moment, which is fine and makes a lot of sense. But we really need to uh, keep our eye on, on sort of these, um, these, these larger, uh, because this, this is these larger things, because this is an interesting window of opportunity um, to, to think about uh, uh, sort of large, um, important impacts on, on, our, on our culture, on our cities, on our spaces, and on our architecture. Yeah. Great, thank you, Hanny. Um, so I would like to open um, for a question with the audience. And actually, one of the questions came in for Hanny, um, and uh, Hanny actually answered most of it. But I'll just read the question to see if you have anything else you would like to add. Um, so the question goes: Mr. Rashid mentioned COVID gave him an opportunity to pause and think or reboot, and not just pay lip service to these issues. What aspect of reboot needs to happen regarding the firm, the design team, about their welfare, and to bring about a change in mindset? Yeah, I mean, on, on the one hand, it's obviously the very pragmatic thing. I mean, here in our office, we've we've changed everything. We do. Uh, we we now work. Uh, you know, social distance, of course. Uh, we 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 Zoom. Uh, we still do a lot of Zoom meeting, um, and a lot of um, sort of uh, you know, uh, let's say. Uh, work uh, remotely. But you know, it's, it's, again, there's a kind of silver lining there. I mean, we have found ourselves in situations all of a sudden uh, that we probably should have been in before um, that just make a lot of sense, which is, you know, being able to interact uh, with people remotely. Now, all of a sudden, you know, I, my, some of my um, really talented students in Vienna, um, whom I just graduated recently, um, you know, it, we had, look, politically in this country, we had problem getting visas. <laughs> <laughs> and working with people abroad. Um, now is a seamless, I have a seamless connection to those, to those guys and those, and, and, and those students, and they're able to, uh, to sort of produce things uh, on a 24 hour clock as we'd always dreamed of doing, but now it's normal, it's natural. Um, there's also uh, the idea that, that we can uh, sort of, as I said before, um, have really um, focused, really focused meetings uh, with, with people uh, you know, all over the world uh, as, as we need to. Um, and and that's, that to me has become a really, um, a really powerful dynamic in, in the new office structure uh, and, and the way we operate. Um, but yeah, I, I think, you know, I, look, the thing about rebooting that's so important, like, like if you were to reboot your computer or, 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 or anything, um, is to really say, okay, the slate is clean. Um, and we are going to put data back in, we're going to put information back in, we're going to put dynamics back in. How do we bring those to the, you know, fold them in in a very systematic and interesting way that will give us uh, better uh, opportunities and better futures? Uh, and I think that, that again runs through the whole spectrum of, of, of interest we have as architects from our practices to the way we produce work, to the way we interact with clients, to the way we teach. Uh, it's, it's a really, really interesting thing to, to be considered. We may not necessarily get it all right, but the fact that we're conscious of the rebuilding process uh, in, in this respect is really interesting. Great, thank you. And, and I think it's also a great thing that we're all thinking a lot more socially um, than before um, with every, every aspect of our practices, but whether it's the way we conduct business, whether it's the way we think about nonprofit organizations, you know, spaces for the public, um, spaces, spaces for the private, you know, so on and so forth. Um, last question, American cities don't have the traditions and legacy of street culture as in Europe and how, and now with remote working and car culture, the suburbs are newly alluring. There are even drive-in movies and New York, New York City now. How can urbanists address what it looks like um, a backward step in U.S. urban living? Um, anybody want to start? Yeah, I, I, I hate to be, be talking too much, but I just want to say very, very quickly, be careful of the suburbs. <laughs> the, the idea that, you know, there's a difference between social distancing and social isolation. There's a difference between uh, sort of, um, you know, uh, being in close proximity with each other, even with a kind of respect for each other's personal space 
and the idea of fencing off your space uh, and, and creating uh, sort of uh, enclaves and, 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 and sort of um, uh, cutting yourself off from a social network. It's imperative that we, that we don't return necessarily to the suburb as we've known it. Now, if there's a, a revision of that and to Shoy's point about food, which I, I think is really right on, on the mark, you know, if there's a revision of that having to do with a new way of living and a new structure for those communities, that's a different story. But the suburban, suburb as we've known it, is a defunct model that we should be very, very careful about. Yeah. Shell, do you have anything to add? Mm, I don't know <laughs> if it's a backward thinking, but um, I think the notion of uh, community is a little bit uh, misplaced here because I heard like in the Japanese rural area, for example, in this moment, they, you know, really support each other and have, you know, uh, all the restaurants are supporting each other, all the kind of consumers are going to the restaurants and buying stuff for them. And I'm not, I know that those things are happening to some degree in New York, but I think that the, the, so the the low density doesn't mean that people don't cooperate. The, the, the fact that there's a car doesn't mean that there people can't, you know, uh, create a community, strong community. And I think uh, I'm hoping that uh, that sent that level of, you know, sense of community, sense of care to each other uh, just remains. So um, I think that's, of course, that's not limited to either city nor the suburbs, but I think that's, that's I, I see the kind of light, uh, bright side of things during the pandemic on that, that, and I'm hopeful that city can still, you know, create this kind of bottom up communities or a community that existed for a long time. Great, thank you. And Jean? Yeah, I think that, that, that um, it was the current statistics that we're gonna um, still reach the population peak at 2070. And I think in the next five years, China is not gonna be the most populous country anymore, India will. And so I think we uh, cannot afford to shrink like Japan, Japan has been doing um, globally. So um, I think it's important that we are invent, reinventing cities as well as reinventing the suburbs. Um, I think as long as we're not burning, you know, um, Amazon jungles and going to the desert of Australia um, and the all territories that we already have occupied are all up for grab for reinvention and making more efficient, making more communities. So, I mean, I think what Hani was saying is that the suburb as we knew it cannot exist anymore, but the territory of suburbs, I think that is a place to still be reimagined. Great, thank you. Keske? Yes, um, I totally agree with, I mean, everyone's talking and then especially like what Shohei mentioned that the, uh, that the, you know, it's the COVID case is kind of re like becoming conscious about the local community and then like kind of like conventional kind of society that how important and how we can kind of we should cherish it but at the same time i've been using the term i don't i'm not sure if it's a collect term terminology in english but the yeah, quantumized kind of personalization or personal or quantumized society that like you don't need to be kind of stick to the uh, where the body is like a five percent of me is on this view and I'm in mean, a uh, screen and then uh, kind of sharing information with you from New York and that kind of thing you can be staying in your living room but you doing your work in the office and then that uh, you know you don't need to be either hundred percent or zero percent it, it especially in it, in Japan or Asian society that uh, you have to be either working in an office, forget about your family or vice versa. That kind of like a clear separation is forced to be, you know, disregard. We have to be kind of quantumized. That might be something new and that might be interesting and have a lot of potential. We might need to get used to it. And, you know, I, I'm quite interested in how the society would change. Okay, great. Um, unfortunately, we are already running late, and I'm very aware of the time for everybody. So um, 
I, I think this is where I will close the conversation for today. I'm sorry that we couldn't get to all of the audience questions. Um, but thank you again to Henny, Jean, Shul, and Kiske for being here today. Um, if you enjoyed our talk about how architects think about um, bringing people together and how cities can be, um, please also check out the conversation we had with colleagues around the world last month. In September, we will look at literature and film and in celebration of the 100th birthday of the writer Eileen Chang, whose work focused on the turbulent 1940s in China. So thank you all very much for joining us. And I would like to thank the Van Allen Institute for helping us cross promote the program. And a shout out to my colleagues, Oscar De La Fe, Navneet Garimella, Cooper Lund, and Kirkup, Maya Murphy, Leanne Chong, Christine Xie, Amy Lee, and Salvador Pantoja, and especially our interns providing the live captions to Briz Mosinen and Andrea Chu. We can't wait to see everybody when we reopen the museum. In the interim, please stay healthy and stay safe. Have a good weekend. Bye. Bye.